Hello and welcome everyone. No Summary is Golden Thread's live stream series of conversations with artists who don't fit in a box. Golden Thread is the first theater company in the US devoted to plays from or about the Middle East. They were founded in 1996 by playwright and director Taranji Yahyazarian and based in on the unceded uh, Ramatoish Ohlone land known colonially today as San Francisco, California. And it's quite special because Taranj is actually in the audience with me here live right now. Uh, so Taranj will be here as well. And we'll say hello to her in a minute. My name is Sarah Fami. Uh, my pronouns are she, hers, and I'm the co-founder and chair of the Middle Eastern Theatre Focus Group at the Association of Theatre and Higher Education and a scholar of Arab decoloniality. By way of visual description, I'm an Arab woman, shoulder length, dark brown curly hair. I'm wearing a colorful scarf uh, and, a, and a, a, red, a dark red sweater uh, shirt. And behind me, I have a dark blue screen uh, and then a microphone right next to me. I'm, join, I'm joining today from the Middle Eastern North African Theater Makers Alliance convening. So the Manatma convening happening right now at the Arab American National Museum, uh, which is on the unceded lands of the Anishkwabi, Miamia, uh, Misagua, Ottawa, Peoria, and Potawatomi uh, nations colonially known as Dearborn, Michigan. A little bit about Manatma before we get started. Manatma is a national movement that was created in 2019 after several years of individual advocacy efforts by some of the most leading figures of uh, leading figures of MENA theater and Middle Eastern companies, Golden Thread being one of them. Uh, and currently Manatma is working towards creating uh, an organization as a 5013C. Before I introduce you to our panelists, I want to have a very warm welcome to the folks who are also in the audience. I am virtual, I am here in, um, in person with some people from Manatma as well. So even though this is a, a, a Zoom session, this will also be hybrid. So today's nice summary episode is titled Critiquing the Critics, the reception of MENA Productions. And for this conversation, I'm delighted to welcome two theater performance professionals, Melik Najad and Kareem Fahmi, who I'll introduce in a moment. Today's discussion will focus on the reception of Middle Eastern North African uh, productions in the US by theater critics. And before I introduce our panelists, I would also like to take a moment to welcome folks who are joining us here on Zoom, uh, as well as those tuning into the live stream on HowlRound. Uh, those here of us in the Zoom room, please feel free to utilize the chat function uh, to post your comments and questions throughout the conversations, and we will leave approximately 10, 10 minutes at the end for a question and answer. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to be joined today uh, with Malik and Karim. Uh, so I'll introduce them briefly. Please feel free to also add to your bios. Um, after I'm done. So Malik Najat is an associate professor of theater arts at the University of Oregon. He's a director, playwright, and scholar of Arab American and Middle Eastern American theater, a founding member of Natma, and the author of several books, most recently, The Middle Eastern American Theater, Communities, Cultures, and Artists. And then our other panelist is Karim Fahmi. A Canadian born, New York City based director and playwright of Egyptian descent. He was named the 2020 TCG Rising Leader of Color, and he's the co founder and chair of the Middle Eastern American Writers Lab. Welcome, everyone. Uh, very happy to have you. And thank you for those of you introducing yourselves in the chat as well. Uh, Karim and Melik, would you like to add anything else to those introductions? Those are very, very brief introductions. No. <laughs> okay, well then, well with that, we will dive right in. 
Um, and also another uh, thing about the panel today, it will be a little bit different from uh, the other the other videos in this series because I do have a live audience here with me at the Arab American National Museum. So occasionally I will ask a question to our panelists and then I will also move my laptop around and you will get a chance to see the folks who are here in person and hear their insights as well. So we will hopefully have a conversation um, as a hybrid conversation. Okay, so then without further ado, let's dive right into these questions. Um, so the first thing that I'd like us uh, to investigate is, have you noticed any changes in mainstream US reception of MENA productions over the last few years? So this can either be productions that you've worked on, productions in general, uh, but have you, in your experience, witnessed any of these changes? And either of you uh, can go first. Take it away, Malik. <laughs> okay, Karim, thank you. Uh, greetings to all of you there in the audience, uh, my dear friends and colleagues. Uh, Sara, thank you for hosting, uh, for narrating, uh, interviewing us today. Um, and also thanks to Golden Thread Productions for inviting uh, us to be here. Um, as far as critical reception, uh, you know, we're in a conundrum. On the one hand, uh, we sometimes get no reviews, which is extremely frustrating. Or when we do get reviews, they're often very um, problematic in the way that they portray our work. Or when we also get reviews, they flatten our work and take away the very Middle Easternness of the work by uh, by calling them human plays, um, and so this kind of this kind of uh, uncertainty uh, in the way that we are perceived, in the way that we are reviewed, is extremely frustrating. Um, our plays can't seem to be uh, taken uh, for their own merit because of what they are and what they represent. Um, they're often uh, either ignored or they're treated very badly by adding elements of Orientalism or racial profiling. Or lastly, they basically skirt the entire issues of the plays. Um, so, so this becomes a, a terrible uh, place to be because it, um, it neither assists us in our mission of creating these works and disseminating them uh, to the wider public, um, or it actually hurts the works in many ways because of these very confused notions uh, of what to do. And, and I think it gets back to the fact that um, I think Americans in general uh, don't know what to do with us, so to speak, but it's in the entertainment field, uh, there, there seems to be just a, a lack of awareness um, of who we are, uh, what, what we represent, and how we manifest that representation on stage or in film or television. So I think that this is the, this is the inherent problem I've been seeing based on the reviews I've read, the reviews I've not received, <laughs> uh, and uh, and the fact that uh, there's been generally a, a frustrating um, incongruence. And and I think it goes all the way back to the very early Arab American writers. I mean, if you go to a bookstore and you look up Khalil Gibran's work, you find it under spirituality, metaphysics. I mean, why? He was a poet. He was a novelist in his own way. Um, yeah, same thing with Amin Rihani. So it started way back in the beginning of the 20th century. They're not knowing what we were and what to do with us. And sadly, it's going on today. And I think that that becomes the, the crux of the problem that we're facing right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Malik says a lot of interesting things. I mean, I, I, I to offer, a, I wouldn't say a different perspective because I agree with a lot of what's being said. I mean, the thing I, I would want to sort of celebrate uh, is the fact that, you know, in my experience, having worked as a Middle Eastern, I mean, being a Middle Eastern theater artist, right, but like being very actively involved in, you know, being a director and an advocate and now a playwright, you know, it feels like when I first, I, I, I guess you could mark my, the beginning of my professional career, like let's say when I finished graduate school back in 2007, just to, to, to be really blunt about it, right? So when I think about the fact that back then, all of the work that I was seeing, I, I live in New York and, and a lot of my, my practice has been New York up until now, 
you know, that there were, anytime I saw characters like myself reflected on stage, they were not even being written by members of our community, right? So, <clears throat> and the fact that like in these year, in these intervening years, you know, it's now becoming increased, not overwhelmingly common, but certainly increasingly common that we actually are seeing our community uh, attaining productions. Like I, I really note the fact that, you know, last season in New York, there were four plays by writers of Middle Eastern descent at major off-Broadway theaters, which to me felt like a huge sort of step forward in terms of the representation of our voices, right? So, you know, I, I uh, what I want to celebrate is the fact that the work seems to be happening on an increasing level um, mm -hmm. and, and being represented at um, theaters, you know, of, of different sizes, uh, traditionally white theaters, uh, you know, predominantly white theaters. So that to me feels like the beginning of a successful journey or, or the evolution of a successful journey that our voices are being seen and that our work is being represented, right? Um, and then I do find it interesting, right, that in in perusing the sort of critical response. So again, I'll, I'll to be really sort of practical, I'll reference the the, the shows that I saw by uh, you know members of our community in New York last season. Um, you know, Mona Mansour's um, uh, Vagrant trilogy, which happened at the Public Theater. There were two productions by Sanas Tusi, wonderful Iranian writer, one at Atlantic Theater Company, and one at Playwrights Horizons, and then Sylvia Khoury's play Selling Kabul, which was also at Playwrights Horizons. You know, what I find interesting about the, the sort of, let's say, critical response of those, at least here in New York, is that <clears throat> this is largely the first time many critics are encountering work from our community. You know, this is the thing that I now am facing as a, as a writer. I mean, I happen to be in a very um, interesting and wonderful position that I'm, I'm having several productions with my plays this season. I have three plays all getting world premieres in this theater season, and there's a total of eight productions with my work happening. And out of those eight productions, I, I believe I could be wrong about the math of this, but I'm pretty sure I'm not, that six of the eight producing organizations I'm going to be the first ever writer of Middle Eastern Scent that those theaters have ever programmed, right? And we're talking about certain theaters that have been programming work for 30, 40, even 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I actually really had to spend a lot of time thinking about that, you know, that yes, it's a win, let's say, right, for the community at large that my work now gets to get represented, right? But like, why is it that in 22 and 23 that I get to be, you know, the first Middle Eastern writer that these theaters have ever programmed? So not necessarily to give the critics the benefit of the doubt, but to name the truth of the matter that sometimes there might be critics who are actually encountering the work of a Middle Eastern writer at a specific organization or theater for the very, very first time, right? So when I contrast that to, let's say, our, our sister underrepresented and misrepresented communities. Some of those communities have a, a longer history of theater happening in predominantly white institutions so that critics might have a different context for that work. You know, they might be able to look at the work of Jackie Sibley's Drury or, you know, Jordan Cooper and put it in relationship to, you know, uh, African-American writers that have come before them, right? what context do they have for me and my work? What context do they have for Sanaz's work, you know? So so I, while I absolutely agree with Malik that sometimes those reviews sort of do might flatten, right? I also wanted to sort of name the complexity that like we are still, I always use the term and, and I wish that I didn't have to keep using it, but I think it's still arguably very true that we're still building a contemporary canon of Middle Eastern American theater, you know, and that we are earlier in building that canon than some of our other communities. So I think that as that canon continues to grow, right, and and starts to represent the, the huge complexity of what our community is, which is so, you know, mixed, right, and frankly, so tied in with whiteness and white passing in certain cases, right, that there'll be hopefully a greater nuance and complexity in the critical response in the same way there's a greater nuance and complexity in the writing nowadays because writers are are, are being given I think a little bit more agency and and freedom to tell the stories that they need to tell yeah I mean and thank you for that like I mean you definitely bring up a lot of really important things about the challenges about the opportunities about the hopefulness of where this is going <laughs> And also the issue of representation and then and coalitions. And I think one of 
one of the really exciting things for me right now in this moment is I'm here at the Manapa Middle East and North African Theater Makers Alliance convening where a lot of these conversations have been happening um, and about, well, what does, how, how do we keep producing work waiting for critical responses and how do we wait for the, for the critics to understand this sort of work beyond the Orientalist tropes and beyond the stereotypes? Uh, do we try to create work that has white passing or assim like white assimilation um, ideas with it in order for it to, to succeed? And how do we measure that mark of success? So thank you for bringing those really important points up. Uh, I want to take a minute before I move on to my next question. I've got, I'm joined here with members of our Manapma community in person as well. So I guess just maybe one, uh, if one person has another comment about, and for folks on Zoom, I will also be repeating this response as well, because our audience members in person are not mic'd. Um, and so have any of you noticed changes in mainstream US uh, reception of, of MENA work? Uh, and perhaps just like in one or two sentences, if anyone would like to speak on that. Um, this isn't typically the no summary structure. However, we wanted to take advantage of the fact that we're here at Manatma and we've got plenty of wonderful voices uh, in the space with us as well. So anything that anyone has noticed, you don't have to, all jump up or speak at once um and also if you would like to wait to be invited into the conversation until a later point that is also welcome okay cool. all right well then we're gonna move on to my next question <laughs> may, um, may i add something yeah Mali, uh, go ahead so, so karim i i, I so I'm, I'm so inspired by your journey as a director and playwright and i'm so happy that you're getting the the due you deserve um you know what is frustrating to me as a historian of this genre is the first arab american play was written in 1908 <laughs> and here we are a hundred years later more and and we're only now getting uh, recognition that this thing exists. This is where I get frustrated, is there have been plays that have been done for about 100 years, and only now are critics saying, oh, this thing exists. How interesting. That is my frustration, is why were we basically erased from theater history for all of this time, ignored for all of this time, um, and only now, in the 21st century, 22 years into the 21st century, are we getting this kind of reception that you were talking about, Karim? So I agree with you. It's wonderful. It's great. We're finally getting productions. We're finally being recognized. But I, I find it baffling that theaters have only now, at this moment, had their first Middle Eastern American playwright on their dockets. So this is where this is where my frustration says both the theater maker. Uh, Arab American theater maker and also as a uh, historian and critic of of theater uh, become very uh, uh, it, it really does upset me and then of course uh, the reviews themselves can be quite upsetting and we'll, hopefully we'll get some time to talk about some specific examples Sara as we go forward but yep. but just just to give you my counter to your counter which I I totally appreciate because Karim I think having the the glass half full um, uh, is a great thing for us because it is happening and it is exciting uh but i i just i it, it's far too late <laughs> this this should have happened much 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 earlier than now and it's a, it's a grueling process uh especially since we're still seeing this recognition in certain theater hubs or the big cities uh and it's still we're still fighting for just sheer existence of hello this is Middle Eastern theater is a thing um, and it has multiplicities and it's multilingual and it has multiple uh, diverse representations. And so it's, we're only just scratching the surface with that. Uh, so I guess my second question, feeding off of Manic, I guess your last point, what are the different considerations, if any, um, that either of you have had to take into consideration when producing plays uh, for companies that are 
on the one hand, exclusively dedicated to the production of MENA work, so Golden Thread, uh, as an example, versus a company that is only just beginning their encounter with uh, Middle Eastern theater productions. Um, and, and I guess, for example, to what extent do you, when you're working with, with the exact same play, maybe these two different companies, uh, do you take white, the white gaze into consideration with this work uh, and with the reception of how it will be received? So I guess we'll go to Melik since we left off with you. Um, and you can well, refer to specific examples. <laughs> I'll give you one example that uh, Ismail Khalidi told me about when his play was produced at a, a, a non-Middle Eastern American company. Uh, he was, you know, very happy that the play was being produced there. It was a solid production. As he walked up to opening night, there was a banner above the theater that had the play, the name of the play in Arabic, but with all the letters disconnected. <laughs> You know that that's a mistake. <laughs> that is that is not taking your audience into consideration. There was a, an attempt was obviously made, but it was a very bad attempt. Um, it, I, I think that when we are trying to work in these companies that are not devoted to Middle Eastern American work, we need to be very clear with them that you know these are plays that are specific to these cultures and these these uh, communities, and uh, that special consideration must be given. And you can't treat it like any other play by Williams or Miller or Shakespeare. It's it's it is wholly different, and it deserves a different treatment. Therefore, you avoid uh, if you're working with designers that are not Middle Eastern, you avoid say Orientalist uh, tropes in design. Um, when you're working with actors, you avoid having them misspeak the uh, the language, whether it's Arabic or Farsi or uh, Turkish, whatever it may be, um, you you uh, you try to uh, um, avoid the the pitfalls that these plays can often fall these productions I should say can fall into, and as uh, playwrights, uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to just insist on not allowing that to happen um, because when it does, it's it's really defeating and it really makes the audience feel uh, feel like they're being taken for granted, in my opinion. So, so I think that that's the kind of extra work that has to be done that at a non-Middle Eastern American theater company. Because when you work in a, in a Middle Eastern American theater company, like Golden Thread, like Silk Road Rising, uh, like Noor um, and others, uh, you really have, uh, you have a, a mentality that doesn't allow for that kind of, um, uh, kind of laziness, artistic laziness to occur uh, because you have somebody there to hold them to account. Um, but I don't feel that that's necessarily always the case in non-Middle Eastern American companies. I have a lot to say about, about this about this topic because I'm like in the throes of it like right now. And I'm really? learning a lot. And it's a and it's a really it's a really helpful, you know, learning experience. And I have to, you know, your question, Sarah, really makes me reflect on. Something that now, you know, in looking back on it, I feel so grateful that, you know, my, in a way, journey towards towards being a playwright, which I am now e alongside being a director, actually really did start out of a relationship with a Middle Eastern theater company, New York Theater here in New York, because they, they were the first theater to essentially commission me as a playwright. I mean, they actually commissioned me as a director, but in doing so allowed me to, and encouraged me to write a play, which became sort of what I call my first play, even though I had written other plays as, as, a, as a youth. But, you know, the first sort of play that I produced in any way professionally in New York and sort of launched me into a career of continuing to, to, to write plays. And in that case that I was working with, um, you know, a Middle Eastern theater company that had, they had all of the cultural knowledge and cultural context to support the work that I was doing. And I was, I like, in a way I took for granted at the time because I was like, well, you know, they know me, they know everything about the culture. And then, you know, subsequently I've worked, you know, almost exclusively in predominantly one institutions. I have directed a workshop at, at um, Silk Road Rising in Chicago, and I haven't yet had the opportunity to work, you know, formally with Golden Thread, but I know that will change one day. But, you know, so my experience has been in, in, PWIs as, as both a playwright and as a director, right? 
And what I'm experiencing at this very moment, I mean, literally like what I was working on this morning and have been for the last few weeks is that I am, as the writer of, of you know, the, the work that's being produced at these theaters this season, I am getting intimately involved in every aspect of how the work is being made, right? Um, and, you know, even prior to, you know, sort of finalizing contracts and all that kind of stuff really did, um, and, and this is, I name this for, you know, other Middle Eastern artists who, who might listen to this, right, is that it's important to outline right from the top what your expectations are and what your sort of non-negotiables are, right? Because what I really wanted to make sure was handled with as much delicacy and, and specificity as possible is all of the things that ultimately are going to affect the audience's experience of the work and how they're interacting with my work as a Middle Eastern artist, right? Which is essentially every aspect of how the show gets made. But just to name some really key ones, it's like, director selection, designer selection, actor selection, very important marketing and outreach, like all of those things. So I am, and, and again, I can't compare my experience to anybody else because it's, it's only my experience, but I'm spending a tremendous amount of my time right now, like really getting specific with all of those aspects of how my productions are being made, right? And I'm asking to look at the marketing language and look at the marketing image, right? Um, and I have to say, you know, it's it's been, I, I, I feel in general, like I've been met with a lot of um, positive response in terms of like, oh, okay, it's, it's important to you that you see that. And I'm really glad that theaters have been open to that because there was an instance in one of my upcoming productions in which you know, a marketing manager sent me a, a, a an image for you know the poster of the show, and actually it happened in two in two different theaters. And I said, you know, there was a there was some imagery that I was just like to me it felt like it really sent the wrong message about the show, right? And you know, it, it wasn't a I'm not I wasn't critiquing them, and I just said, you know, this does, this misses the mark for me. Um, and I tried to be as specific as possible so that the next time that happens, if another Middle Eastern artist gets the privilege that I do of having those productions, maybe if that marketing manager is still in that position, they'll have, the, something will have happened, right? So I, I, again, trying to approach it as here's somebody who maybe has never, <laughs> you know, had to market a show by a Middle Eastern writer, you know, in, in one of my shows deals explicitly with Islam and the practice of Islam, right? So the, the imagery related to Islam is something that you know, obviously those of us who come from a Muslim background sort of understand the complexity of like Muslim iconography or imagery, right? So I was just sort of explaining like why that missed the mark for me, right? But so all, all of that to say is that I think our community in particular can't take for granted that like we have to be very hands-on because again, we are sort of setting a standard, right? We are setting a standard for what you know, the next generation of Middle Eastern artists is gonna experience, right? So I'm taking that responsibility very, very seriously because if compromise, if I allow compromises to be made now, those compromises sort of like get solidified, right? It's like, you know, but if if somebody's like, oh, well, Kareem Fahmy got, you know, casting approval and designer approval and, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm hoping that that next artist can ask for the same thing, you know, but, just to say to not take for granted that those things will be granted to you, you know, um, and not that I had to fight for it, but you know, there are a couple of times where, you know, I've asked a question and, and somebody's like, oh, no playwright has ever asked that question before. And I was like, well, you know, that, that shows that, you know, there's a, a, a different level of commitment, I think that we have to make. And it is, I'm not going to lie, every once in a while it feels a little like burdensome, you know, like when we're talking particularly about, you know, talking about the complexities of casting and talking about, you know, how we're holding space for complicated conversations. But I do think we're at a really interesting moment in sort of the, 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 the present and possible future of Middle Eastern theater, right, where we are starting to see you know, a, a broader complexity of stories being told, a more diverse roster of artists. I think some very interesting plays as well that are emerging um, from some of our more established playwrights and some of our earlier career playwrights. But it, it's when those shows move into production, which is ultimately how the audience is going to be experiencing them, right? Because again, I think of literary uh, theater, it's not a literary art form, but an art form that is about production, right? Um, 
I do think that it 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 is the responsibility of the artist, right? The generative artist. So in, in this instance, I'm talking about myself as a playwright to 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 be very hands on and minding how those things are made. And not, and and I try to to go into all of those situations with good faith assumptions, right? That you know, if the theater is programming my work, they want to do it well, um, and that if I can help them do that, and and also sort of help open their eyes to how all artists should be supported regardless of their you know racial or ethnic background then you know I'll have done sort of a net good for the field but it is it is let's say maybe more work than some of our uh, some, some people who don't come from our community might be facing in those same situations yeah Karim uh, I I faced a similar situation in publishing so when my book came out Middle Eastern American theater the the marketing department sent me a photo of a production of Pera Palace that was done in Britain and I was oh, I was horrified it was so orientalist so wrong you know and I had to face that moment of what do I say you know because the the marketing manager was so excited about the image and and I, I just really struggled, but I thought I just have to say something. This is not acceptable. And so I I did, and it was an awkward conversation, but a necessary conversation. And we finally were able to get uh, one of Taranja's productions uh, placed on the front cover instead. So so yeah, I think that we we all need to have uncomfortable conversations with these publishers, producers, theater companies. Um, it, it behooves us to do that, even as as awkward as it is, as difficult as it is. But yeah, as you said, Karim, it sets the stage, so to speak, um, for future productions and allows for less of that kind of, again, uh, just mistaken uh, identity that could occur if we don't, if we don't say something. So that is part and parcel of the work. And uh, and it's unfortunate we have to do that. I mean, people who produce, <laughs> who, I'm sure that, you know, people who produce plays that are not of an experience other than the, you know, mainstream American experience, usually don't have to do this at all. This is not even their problem. But for us, it is a, it's an extra burden and one that we have to take on. So I'm going to complicate that a little bit specifically in relation to the reception by theater critics. Uh, so you've both spoken to this, and it's such a fatigue. It's like this unspoken, invisible labor that happens, that goes uncredited, that nobody often thinks about, except those of us who are in the room, so mean theater makers who are trying to make this happen. Um, and it's often like, well, who has that burden of, of educating and, and kind of undoing that racism. Why is the, the undoing of racism falling on the shoulders of those who are impacted by it and those who are oppressed by it? And so this is a whole other conversation of that. And uh, and something that I that I keep thinking about in terms of agency, in terms of how we as, as playwrights, as directors, as actors, as uh, people involved in marketing have that agency and begin learning how to take that agency one of the places, and please challenge me on this if I am incorrect, but I don't know how much agency playwrights and directors might actually have when it comes time to a theatre critic. Because a theatre critic comes in and you can't, and they have their own views and they have their own perceptions. And so I guess this opens up a further conversation of how many uh, theatre critics of minoritized backgrounds are there? How many theatre critics of Middle East and North African descent are there out there? And, and if the answer is none or very limited, then how do we, how do you think we can prepare ourselves for, or, or to have more Middle East and North African uh, theatre critics? Because we, I don't know that we have agency um, once it's out there because it's their opinion. But isn't that what criticism is, right? I mean, like I, I've been thinking a lot about this question, right? Because I was like, what am I going to say about criticism, right? And and I, you know, I can't help but go right back to, and I mean, this conversation is coming at a really interesting time in that I just, you know, closed my first ever, you know, full fully professional production as a playwright. So essentially, the first time that my work as a playwright has been you know, subject to criticism, and and I got a bunch of reviews, right? So you know, and and I any playwright, you know, playwrights out there will will agree, like any playwright, 
and, and I think this is much more true for, for a playwright than being both a playwright and a director. I sort of feel, I, I felt it in a very, very different way as a playwright than as a director, right? Because as a director, well, anyways, for obvious reasons, right? But as a playwright, I'm like, okay, I am putting on, I am telling a very, you know, specific story that is dealing with, uh, so, you know, my play Dode and Diana has an Egyptian character. I'm, I'm from an Egyptian background and a white character, right? And there are some, you know, let's say very provocative at times. And to me, I think very sort of like darkly funny um, looks at like what it means to be a Middle Eastern American artist because one of the characters in the play, the Middle Eastern character is an actor, right? Um, and I was reflecting actually to an Egyptian colleague of mine who's an actor who, who saw the show. I was having a coffee date with him the other day and, and I, I was there when he watched the show and he was able to sort of read and receive the that you know use of humor in such a specific way that non Middle Eastern people you know largely were incapable of right so to me it's still a net win because I'm like well I didn't necessarily write you know the play for that white critic or that white audience and maybe in a way at least those moments were you know, you call them an Easter egg for that, you know, that's kind of specific audience member, right? But I know that my work had the intended effect because that actor, you know, that person, that audience member was able to really understand what I was doing, you know? Mm -hmm. And and I read, you know, people are like, don't read your reviews, don't read your reviews. I was like, okay, look, this is the first time this is happening to me. So I'm going to read these freaking reviews, you know, because I really wanted to learn something about what it means to be a playwright in, in conversation with critics, right? Because I, I remember something that I learned when I was a young theater maker that I, I want to believe is still true, right? But it was from a very sort of, um, you know, hopeful place where they talked about the triangulation between the work of the theater artist, the audience and the critic, right? And that, that it's a triangular sort of conversation in which the critic is actually performing a very important function for, sort of a translation of the work from, from the theater maker to the audience, right? Now, <laughs> what I would argue that it's less about, let's say, the, the racial background of a critic, the, um, um, the, the sort of gaze of the critic, because I think that, that that's a pretty broad approach. It's the fact that criticism, theatrical criticism in this country in general has really, the quality of it has really plummeted over the last several decades, right? And that the art form of criticism isn't being celebrated and taught. And um, therefore, I think that the, the, what I perceived, right? And even some of the, let's say more reputable um, publications that did review my work is that the quality of the criticism itself felt to me very kind of lacking. It lacked in just a critical response period, sort of irrespective of the sort of my work as a Middle Eastern artist, right? So I will be very sort of curious for myself to track. I will read the rest of my reviews this season because I do think it's an important thing for me as the artist to understand how that work is being received. But, you know, the conversations I've been having internally with some of my colleagues is like, how do we either sort of encourage the critical community, right? And, and part of it is like, who is critiquing and why are they critiquing and how are they getting those jobs? And then I've heard of, you know, the, the complexity of what criticism is doing for the, the, the field. Um, and also going like, do critics still matter, you know? And I actually don't know the answer to that question anymore. I, I literally don't know, you know? Um, so, so to me, it's like, I think just like there's a greater diversity in artists whose work is being represented. Yes, we wanna see that diversity um, in the critical community as well. But I'm more interested in having the conversation of like, how can we make that criticism, the art form of that criticism as itself as sort of, um, um, successful as it, I think it wants to be in response to the really interesting work that is happening today. So that was a very long monologue, but Malik, I don't know how you're sort of responding to that, but that's well, what I've before, been- Before you respond, Malik, too, I guess also adding on to that, do you think that the scholarship aspect, so like within, because you've done a lot of, of scholarship, a lot of like academic publications on this, and that is theater criticism. And how do you think that is different from theater criticism that is happening outside of the academy as well because of what you're you're interacting with well okay so theater is an ecosystem 
right? We need all of the parts of the ecosystem to work in tandem if we're going to have a successful theater. Uh, I, I really find uh, artists who say critics don't matter to be problematic because they are part of that ecosystem. For better or worse, they're part of the ecosystem. So what we need is we need to not necessarily diversify the entire field because that's impossible. Um, you know, these these uh, papers of note, let's call them, uh, hire, you know, people out of the, the big schools and they, they get people with reputations, most likely not minorities sometimes. And so we have to deal with that. However, I think that we need to be uh, looking at theater holistically. So when I talk to people of Middle Eastern descent and I say, you know, you're, you know, I would encourage you to encourage your child to go into this field. It's not always to be a director or a playwright or an actor or whatever, an actress, whatever. It's also, you know, go into academia, go into uh, the places where we can start to build that ecosystem. So for instance, I teach classes in Middle Eastern American theater and Middle Eastern theater. And my, my classes are predominantly not minorities in Oregon, that's a given. So uh, essentially uh, I'm hoping that I'm going to infuse those students with the cultural background necessary to understand these plays. And I assign them uh, essays where they have to critique the plays and write about them. And I give them notes and we have this back and forth. We have a dialogue, a academic dialogue about these things. And same thing with graduate students. I encourage them to write uh, critiques in academic journals in order to uh, understand plays. So that is a very vital part of this ecosystem. And um, my feeling is, as with you, Karim, the, the quality of criticism has declined for multiple reasons. I think the corporatization of newspapers is very problematic. They're getting rid of critics instead of adding them. I mean, here we have very few critics left working in any of our periodicals. Um, but then also we don't have that kind of quality of criticism that you're referring to, Karim, which Harold Klerman gave a criterion of being a critic. And if you read it, you feel like you have to have five PhDs, but he's kind of right about this. Um, so, so I feel that we need to have more people on the inside, so to speak, of journalism, academia, and other places, theaters, in order to, to you know, create the conditions by which cri criticism can be done well based on the works that we we create. And so that for me is a, a very um a, it's a it's a missing component. And and we've had we have very few people, uh, though it's growing, thank goodness, in academia who are teaching students, uh predominantly non-Middle Eastern students, how to look at these plays more holistically, uh within their context and uh to understand them uh better so that if they do go off and become critics, um, they perhaps will have that kind of background and say, yeah, you know, I read Middle Eastern plays for a, a semester at this university. I have a sense of what they are. So now I can write about them because I've done it before. And so this is the kind of ecosystem we need to continually build if we're going to have a really healthy uh, ecosystem that that will help to critique our work properly, rather than having critics that have only read the, the great American canon or British canon, which excluded us completely for generations. Um, and uh, and they come to look at our plays through the lens of uh, looking at a Tennessee Williams play or an Arthur Miller play or Eugene O'Neill play. They're fundamentally different plays, uh, even though, yes, they have acts and actors and dialogue, all of that, that's fine. But, you know, one needs to understand the cultural background in, in understanding this. So I feel that that is a major step that needs to continually be taken if we're going to have proper criticism of our work in the future. Yeah, thank you for that, Malik. And I completely agree with that, of, of the multifaceted approaches to how to dismantle this systemic uh, oppression, systemic racism that has been against us for so long. Before I open this up to questions from the audience and to ask my last final question, I'd like to take this moment to ask those of you in uh, uh, in joining us in person here at Minatma, um, is there anything kind of going off of this question of uh, the future that we want to see? Of how do we how do we continue working where? It's like with, with, with the current situation that we've got, where we have very limited representation within theater critics, um, 
I just want to invite you into this conversation of is there anything that that you're seeing that you've been surprised by or is there a, a specific response uh that caught you off guard or that you weren't expecting in any sort of way and then how do you think we can continue moving into this future as well Sara, as you wait for that answer, can I bring up just a few interesting things I've noted in, in, in my research into this particular field mm -hmm. in preparation? Um, first of all, Jamil's conversation about heady vice. Uh, if Jamil's in the audience, perhaps uh, Jamil can give us- Jamil is in the audience. Yes. Hello, my friend. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that that is a very interesting uh, back and forth exchange that Jamil engaged in, in the way that his work was being treated by the uh, Chicago critics. Um, but also, I just want to bring up a few things about uh, what's recently happened. The Vagrant Trilogy opened on April 8th uh, and ran through May 15th. And the New York Times published their review on May 10th. Think about how late that is in a run. And how how on the final week you published the review, and unfortunately by that time the two lead actors were out ill, and so they saw the understudies perform, so they didn't even see the original production. That is a problem. Why were they so late to this production? They should have been there earlier to garner more odd buzz or whatever you want to call it in order for people to come see this production. So that was problematic. Um, you know, uh, I was looking at the review of Dodi and Diana that was done in the New York Times, um, Karim, and, and they rarely <laughs> issued Arabness, and they only mentioned the character's racial and cultural differences, as if it was just a sidebar. And I think there's more to it than just a sidebar. Um, Noura uh, had a review in the Wall Street Journal, but it was under the opinion section not the arts. I don't understand why. Why is it under the opinion section? It's an, it's a work of art. So that was, oh, odd. even though it was, it gave effusive praise, but it was in the wrong section. Um, and, uh, you know, time and time again, we see this flattening uh, of, of it. And, and also when I directed uh, Scenes from 71 Years at Golden Thread, we received almost no periodical uh, in San Francisco that gave us a review. It's outrageous. I mean, why? Why wasn't that? I personally think it was because of the Palestinian-ness of the play and the, the uncomfortability that critics have with dealing with Palestine, frankly. And similarly, I think the same thing could probably be said about the Vagrant Trilogy. So again, all of these critics, you know, they they inter they engage with our work in different ways, but they tend to just skirt the real issues that these plays are about, looking for more of a human uh, experience, you know, uh, they, they they said uh, of Nura, they said uh, it preaches no sermons. It will send you home not to do anything in particular, but Miss Raffo has given us a human drama. So again, trying to take away any Arabness, take away any Iraqiness, take away any, and turn it into just a, a human play. So these are the problems that we face. They keep trying to rob the plays of their in, their inherent Middle Eastern ness, in my opinion. Yes, it is. And I guess coming out of this conversation, I think I really want to encourage our audiences to continue thinking of this because it's something that we always grapple with of the current situation with theatre critics as it is. Uh, it's a disservice to our playwrights, it's a disservice to the theatre that we make. And, and it's unfortunate because you can't even offer a, a critical response uh, when you're so clouded with with the inabilities to actually speak about the artistry itself. And so how are we ever going to support our artists or support our directors or playwrights or actors ever advance if they're never even given that opportunity for their work to be seen in the way that it's actually truly beautiful and, and really powerful and in the ways that we know it is. And I think the hard thing going back to something that Karim, that you said in, earlier of you had that one, um, the one other Egyptian friend who came in and saw it and like shared those moments. And you're like, yes, this is when I knew that I had succeeded. And so it's interesting that when people from the MENA community come to see the plays, it resonates with them and, and they realize the brilliant artistry in it. And yet when, when it's open to theater critics 
it's a different conversation. Um, in the last few minutes that we've got, I'd like to invite our audiences. If you've got any questions, please pop them in the uh, in the chat box. I'm happy to respond to them. And those of you in person, if you have any questions, I will be repeating them into the Zoom screen as well. Uh, but do we have any questions? And perhaps we can even go back to the question of critique, the title of this series itself or of this uh, session of critiquing the critics um, of what do they miss even when they're trying to critique something. Uh, yes, Eliza in the back. So I've got an in-person question. So I will listen to it. Uh, I encourage you to stand up or come as, okay, great. Come as close as possible to me and then I'll repeat it into the screen. Middle Eastern work um, can um, can do. One is through job training and uh, informing their audience of the backgrounds of the play, the certain certain elements that they might not know because they're not of Middle Eastern descent, and also by doing that, also provides the critic with um, with the information that they might not because I think a lot of critics today, I don't know, they don't do their research. And I think they um, need to be encouraged to do so. So by having a drama poet on hand to help um, facilitate more information about the world of the play would be tremendously helpful. And I also think cultural advisors are mm. absolutely mandatory for theaters that have never done this kind of work. I know personally from uh, a production of my play uh, that I did in uh, in a, in a theater that when I walked into the theater and saw the set design, it was absolutely nothing like what I had written. And I had a choice to make. Do I go with that because I respected the director and hoped that, uh, what could I learn from it? Which is the choice I ultimately did make, but it wasn't the play I wrote. It was completely, completely changed. Um, from this director's uh, point of view. So uh, I think I think having those kind of two things, cultural advisors and excellent dramaturgy to help support the world of the play would make a great difference because our writers today are not educated, a lot of them. Oh, yes. I mean, not, not critics, that's what I'm saying, not our writers. And I take it from seeing your responses that you could hear that clearly. That is absolutely correct. correct. Yes, yes, we need, uh, theaters need to invest in our plays outside of just picking a play by a Middle Eastern American playwright. They need to invest in a dramaturg or a cultural advisor or both. Um, I completely agree. Or an assistant. How about an assistant director? You know, that could help. Um, those kinds of things are necessary. They're crucial for us to have proper um, dramaturgy for these works. And uh, and I, I, I feel that theaters tend to, they want some of us, but not all of us, right? Mm -hmm. I'll take your play and I'll take your playwright, but the rest of the, the crew, the staff will be, or the production team will be our regular production team. And frankly, that's not acceptable. It's almost like they're trying to check a box by saying, there we go, we've done it. And ultimately when then funders look at the theaters or when audiences are coming in to look at the theaters, what they'll see is they'll see, oh, well, Kadeem Fahmy was produced here. Great. They did the thing. They're diversifying. What they're not seeing is the behind the scenes and who was involved with how did it actually come to fruition? Um, I've got a couple of, I've got two other questions. Three. Can you hear Taranj? Did you ask for a cultural consultant or were you ever offered that option by the eight productions you're having currently? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's I have a complex feeling around cultural consultancy, having been been a cultural consultant myself, right? Um, and so, what I've been sort of endeavoring for is is more a sort of a culturally specific dramaturg, um, because I think to me, because these are world premieres, the most important thing is that the, what's being held, the, the space that's being held in the room, is so that the artists of Middle Eastern descent, myself. You, uh, included, including the actors, because of course all of these plays feature roles for Middle Eastern actors, are, are able to have a sort of complex and nuanced conversation around it. And then what I've been uh, less involved in, but but 
hopefully will be increasingly involved in is also having sort of cultural connectors in each of the communities where the work is being seen so that that sort of audience engagement component is also dealt with. Um, and so, it, you know, this is again a learning curve for me, but having been a cultural consultant myself, I think what the theaters tend to really want to prioritize, which I actually agree with, I'm talking about the PWIs, is community engagement because they haven't engaged with our communities before. And I think that's so much better done on the ground from people who are already represented in that community. So bringing in a cultural consultant from the outside to work on the community engagement component has, at least when I've been asked to do that, has been proven to be very unsuccessful. So, you know, similarly, what I was talking about before, what I can control is how is the art made and what is story is the art being told. So what I've been really advocating for is culturally specific dramaturgs and making sure that people who sort of represent the cultures in the story are actually represented in the room. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna go to Jamil and then I'll go to a question in the chat. And then one final question, and that will be our time. Oops. So I just <laughs> want to build on uh, what Malik had said about our experiences. So Chicago has a long history of um, racist critics. <laughs> and I'm not just talking about critics who are, are subtly racist in, um, in their reviews, but just you know people who sort of see it as their role to, to gatekeep in a certain way. Um, and the critic who, who Malik had mentioned um, had, you know, a history of, of attacking any work um, that had, you know, any association with Arabs or Middle Eastern people or Muslims. Um, and, you know, we stood up to her and we pushed back and uh, we paid a, an enormous price for that. And I probably don't even know the extent of the price that we paid for that. But I think it's so important for us all to remember that we can push back, we can call out a critic and we can refuse to deal with a critic. And fast forward a number of years, what happened in the Chicago theater community was um, artists were demanding that she not be invited to openings. Uh, and there was a very strong collective response on the part of the community, but particularly artists of color, or overwhelmingly, let's say, artists of color, who said, we will not accept her uh, in the audience. And so, you know, it is, it is not an easy fight to fight, particularly at that, you know, early time when everyone was telling us, do not do this. Are you crazy? You're going to, you know, all of that. But I, I think we, we cannot lose sight of the fact that um, we don't have to tolerate that. Mm -hmm. We do not have to put up with that. And I think that also speaks to the true strength of coalitional building. And this is why an organization like NATMA is, is really, really exciting because it, it gives us that agency of connecting playwrights, directors, uh, production companies from all around the country to be able to stand up together and not just as isolated voices and get the backlash as one individual, but rather as this is the statement from the entire community. Um, I want to go to a question in the chat and then one final audience in-person question. Uh, so Giselle asks, I'm curious about the possibility of changing criticism from one person critiquing and writing a singular article to having two to four different people have a dialogue and then writing about dialogue into newspapers. Malik mentioned mm. that critics might need four PhDs, but what if we put several minds together to have a dialogue after a play and publish their conversation instead? I like that I, idea. I love, <laughs> I love that idea. But with the cutbacks in newspapers that are happening, it's hard enough to get one critic on a newspaper staff at all. And so this is the problem. So then maybe we need to just be, unfortunately, asked to be paid either an honorarium or a volunteer or whatever in order to have a that kind of dialogue or panel about the work. I don't know. But that's a great idea. And, and that does happen 
more often in, in uh, uh, theater um, podcasts, you know, I have actually seen that model, heard that model as it were, because they're podcasts in which multiple critics will see a show and have a conversation about it. Um, but that type of model hasn't necessarily translated to sort of published um, media outlets yet, but I have seen it in podcasts and I actually think it's effective because in a way, like what any good criticism is, it is a conversation. So taking that form and putting it into actual conversation between people of different viewpoints who have seen the show d does open up, I think, a lot of interesting perspectives that sort of a one person's sort of critical response sometimes can't, you know? And it's definitely within potential realm of possibilities of what does, there's a lot of conversations about decolonizing theater and, and decentralizing and, and deconstructing a lot of these systemic uh, issues and maybe this is part of it. How do we decolonize theater criticism? Um, and and so I want to praise you, Sara. I want to praise Halabai. I want to praise those academic critics that are writing long form criticism in academic journals. Now, granted, these things get published like a year and a half after the production closes, but they're there for posterity's sake. And that's really important that future generations can look back. So hopefully Middle Eastern American generations can look back and say, oh, that's a really great critique by a Middle Eastern American art mm -hmm. uh, scholar about a Middle Eastern American play. So, so I just I I want to I want to tip my hat to to all of those academic scholars that are writing real academic and long form criticism of these works that will hopefully outlast all the the less you know I, in my opinion the lesser journalistic uh, critiques that come out regularly that is that is the hope and thank you for that Melik you're you're leading a lot of that and it's um a lot of that work it's a tiny but mighty community and we're excited for the future that we're continuing to build of that um one final question I'm awkwardly walking towards Susie um Susie well, what is well, your my question is actually very similar to the one that was just read um, and I always am like, if it doesn't work, can we throw it away and do our start anew? Um, when you, we talk about long form academic or newspaper criticism from art critics, can we say there's so many media, so much media that is able to reach people very quickly. So not being delayed till after show where we can, can we be our own critics? Can we find YouTube, TikTok, social media and finding this way of having that and building audience, especially uh, building new audience who, who can find out about those things and maybe say, we don't have to do it that same way, or we don't have to rely on those same people hmm. to gatekeep what can be said about our work. Yeah, the possibilities, yes. <laughs> the, the possibilities of growth of how we can continue, how can we continue developing this and and how can we fix the system, but also how can we completely get rid of what isn't starving our communities and what we know has never starved um, and moving forward with it as well. Um, with that, I don't see any other questions in the in the chat. What are the role, what's the role of audiences receiving these critiques? That is a very good question. <laughs> What is the role of audiences receiving these critiques? That's a tough one to answer. I mean, I think it depends on what an audience member is seeking out. If if they are if they are seeking out a review, you know, and actually just to the comment that was just made, it's like, what is the purpose of criticism, right? Which, you know, we could have another three hour session about that, right? Because mm -hmm. in some ways, right, is criticism about a prospective audience member being, should I see this show or should I not, right? Or is it actually a tool for, let's say, an artist to, and this is why I go back to my point about like the art of criticism and the function of criticism, right? Like if I can learn from a critical response that if the intended effect of my work was um, named, acknowledged, and then criticized, right? Then that that piece of criticism is actually providing a very important function to me as the artist, right? Uh, which I think in a way is sort of the, the what criticism was actually meant to do is like, 
analyzing the intended effect of the piece of art, right? And whether from that critic's expert opinion, whether that is happening or not. I think what is sometimes problematic is that we're also sort of conflating criticism with like audience engagement, right? And I often bring up this point in relation specifically to theater criticism, right? That, you know, like let's say in the ecosystem of new plays here in New York, there are there is essentially one publication that sort of holds the future of so much of what a play can be, which is the New York Times, right? And one of the conversations we've often had is like, why is one publication, you know, granted that much power? Whereas let's say in the film industry, if, you know, A.O. Scott says, you know, this film is a masterpiece, you know, that film could still bomb, <laughs> right? Or if A.O. Scott says this play is a piece of crap, uh, this movie is a piece of crap, people might still go and see it, you know? Like people are gonna see whatever, you know, a superhero movie, even if A.O. Scott thinks it's crap, right? Whereas, you know, what happens in theater when one critic is saying this play is the most important play of a generation and therefore that, you know, makes a playwright's career, that's one person's opinion, right? So uh, again, it, it's like, what is the intended effect of criticism, right? Both intrinsically and extrinsically, right? And that functions very differently depending on what market you're talking about, what publication you're talking about, the intended effect. So it's, it's, a, it's actually a very, very sort of complex issue in terms of like how criticism affects our work as theater artists, right? And, and what it's doing in the individual markets. Absolutely. Now maybe maybe we need a website like Rotten Banadura or something. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we can we can bring all these critiques together. The problem is we don't have that many. You know, I mean, in the film, if you look at Rotten Tomatoes, there's like thirty critics, uh, and you can read a, a, a diversity of criticism and make your own mind up. With us, we literally might have one, two critiques out there, and so maybe there there might be a way that we can try to find a way to have more voices brought together. I mean, what about the idea of us filming our productions only for uh, a group of critics that are across the country uh, that are in the Middle Eastern American community? And so everybody can write these critiques and post them somewhere or, you know, create it, create our own journal or something. You know, that might be a way of doing this. I don't know. But yeah, I think, Karim, we need that. We need more. We just need that diversity of voices and, and, and multiplicity of, of voices the way the film industry has. Uh, we just don't have it right now. And I think that that really injures us. And it doesn't really help us to raise all the boats, so to speak. I am so sad that we are going to have to cut this conversation over here. I feel that we have just only scratched the surface. And I think that this is, we're, we're, we're unleashing a new possibility and we're having these wonderful conversations. And I'm really excited that we're having them during Monotonous Convening as well, because I think that we have the, the capacity to shape the future of, of theater. And maybe it's on digital realm. Maybe that possibility that you just envisioned, Malik, is not actually that far away from us. So we could actually, it is within our grasp uh, and through coalitional building, we can do that. I want to um, I want to thank you again, Karim and Malik, for joining us today. Thank you so much. I want to thank my in-person audience. Um, it has been an, it's been an absolute pleasure having both of you here. I'm, and I'm also so, um, so appreciative of our audiences on Zoom for being here. And I and as always, I want to thank uh, Wendy Rice for your technical support and to the rest of the Golden Threads, small but mighty team, Sahar, Michelle, Linda, Sheila, and Navid. We could not do this without you and without your continuous support. I would also like to thank HowlRound for hosting this live stream event. Um, a rec and a recording of this session will be available on both HowlRound and Golden Threads websites. Uh, so last but not least, thank you again so very much. Um, and Heather, of course, thank you so much for that. And, and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. And please check the Monatma website and Golden Threads websites. Uh, if you would like to continue being a part of this conversation, we would love to continue engaging you. So thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.
Mm-hmm.